Hello, Internet. I am here today to talk to you about Bora Bora. Finally! It took me a couple takes to make this video. We are going to be talking about a new Stuffenfeld game. Uh, Ravensburger picked it up in the States, which is kind of cool for me because that makes nice bits and really pretty graphics. Uh, they don't really sponsor games that don't have those things. The one downside was I couldn't figure out how to make the video make sense. The game is stupid complicated and really awesome, but you want to see it, you want to feel it, so getting that feeling into a video meant for YouTube meant some challenges for me. So I've put it off for a few weeks and now it has all come together and I hope it makes sense. Watch out for reshoots, <laughs> I probably had to do a couple. I hope you love it. Bora Bora plays from two to four players, let's see. Bora Bora plays from two to four players, plays in about an hour or two, depending on the number of players and how long it takes them to make an action. And it, it was very, very good at four. It gets a little less good as you go fewer players, but that's fine. It actually works really well at two, it's just that it's so much better at four. Uh, and I wouldn't teach it down, unless you've got a gamer kid, I wouldn't teach it much less than maybe 11 or 12 years old. Uh, that being said, beautiful bits and lots of stuff to do, so let's get started. So setup and components for Bora Bora is actually pretty complicated. Um, what you'll need to do is set out a randomized number of these little fish tokens next to each of the islands. Um, they range from values of 1 through 5, but you just put them out, or 1 through 6, I think. Uh, you'll have tasks men and women cards for the next turns. All of the jewelry tokens will go onto the board at the beginning of the game and will be available one row per round. So you can see it's played over six rounds. Uh, you have some god tiles. You have player pieces at the beginning of the priest track, or the tattoo track, pardon me. And you have a couple of player pieces on the score track. Because you'll win by victory points, but they're a lot of the pieces in the game are actually going to gain you those victory points. Uh, the player boards themselves, you'll place each of your huts over the squares on the right side of your board. Each player will be given three tasks at the beginning. You have some buildings here. You'll start with a couple god tiles, and these are your priests that you can place onto the board later. Next up, we'll decide which of the dice placement tiles you need for your game. So the more players you have, the more tiles you'll have. The way this works is that you'll always have this one, which is a build a building tile and a fire bonus. You'll have a trade dice for stuff tile. You'll have a god card tile. And now these are the ones that are variable. So in a smaller game, when you have fewer players, the movement is one card, so you either take a, a water or a land movement. But in multiplayer games, four players where you really want to be in this game, you'll have both a land and a water movement card. Same with the man-woman tiles. If you have fewer players, you'll have a one tile that you'll get to choose either a man or woman tile. But in larger games, you'll have both. So in a four-player game, you're going to be looking at something like this, where you have six different options, whereas in fewer players, you'll have fewer options there. Uh, so we'll set those out as if we were playing four players, even though I'm giving you kind of a, a two-player demo type thing. Uh, you have all your bits out, so these are things you'll earn by building your huts onto the islands. You've got some shells, you've got some offerings, you've got extra tiles, and I have more tiles, as I said. And then you have the god cards, and these will be relevant during certain actions. Uh, I will probably just go over the relevant card when we're going over the action that it pertains to. There's no real reason for me to tell you beforehand when it will make more sense when we're actually talking about that. The last thing we do for setup is for each player to earn two medium strength tasks. They're dark green on the back if they're 
a little harder to do. And there are, the beginning of the game will have light green tasks, and these are way easier to get, so they want something you can accomplish every round, because Bora Bora is one of those games where if you can do something every round, you're going to get some bonus points. The game itself is broken out into three different rounds, as you can see on the board here. The first round will roll dice and place them and take actions. The second will activate men or women that we've collected during the game. And the third one is kind of a cool cleanup step which involves um, our turn order and a couple of victory points, our priest track and some awesome god tiles, jewelry buying, and task completing. Uh, this first step of the last one will give you a new player order. So they have these really handy cards so that you can just hand out player order as it's accomplished and you don't have to pay attention to anything on the board because it's going to change during that phase. So first we'll go over the dice placement round and how that works. Alright, each first phase players will take their 3d6s and roll them to get their values for the rest of the round. Ah. And green player, because I am all players at all times. Um, we have a 613 and a 356. Now, it is important to note that having a lot of large number of dice in this game is actually kind of a detriment. Having a nice one high die and a couple low die is actually what you really want to see, unless you're first in a four player game. Because the more high dice you have, the fewer options you're going to have as, as you place your dice on the board. Now, the way that this works is, and I won't explain what this is doing until we've gotten to the card, but player A places a 5 onto a card. Now, player B can play anything less than what player A has played there. So, a 6 and a 5 have now become discounted. So, if player B takes a 1 and places it onto a card, they're saying that unless you're using a god card, this space is no longer available. So you can see the benefits of having a couple of low dice with a high die. You can claim something for a nice big benefit and then later come in and shut something down with a low die. Now, which gods was I talking about? There are two relevant gods. There are blue gods and white gods. Uh, the first one we'll talk about is a blue god. So whenever you play a god card, you play it when it's appropriate, so when I'm placing my die, it would be very appropriate to play this blue god, and it costs one offering tile. You'll earn these harvest tokens through either throwing your dice away for stuff, for building and priest track bonuses, and also uh, you'll get these through some of the migration stuff out on the islands. Now. Uh, the different cards have different actions associated with them. And the number you place on the card tells you how powerful of an action you're going to take. So, the first one that's up is the priest track. Um, you're sending your dice off to pray. And so the value you place here tells you how powerful the priest is, but also, as I said, will shut people down if they don't have lower dice. So, this one's a little harder to play the low dice on because you have the opportunity of losing your priest. How does that work? Let's just go for the big bad priest. Let's put a six on here. That means you take one of your four priest tokens and you place it into the sixth part of the priest track on the board. So that is way over here. And there are numbers down below all the way through one. And a fire bonus as you place your priest. Fire bonuses are pretty straightforward. They're on your board you'll see that a fire bonus either nets you a god card, either one of the three that are always face up, or one off the top of the deck, a harvest token, or, or I'm sorry, the one or the other of those, and you either get a tattoo or a shell. Shells are very important, they're used to buy jewelry, and tattoos, whoop, back to the other side, are used to declare a uh, player turn order and also net you some victory points at the end of each round. So tattoos can be incredibly powerful, netting you all, all the way up to 15 points if you play your cards right. Oh, that's bad puns. So the priest that goes there that plays a six would go on the sixth spot. So next player can play any value they like and also join you in the priest track over here, maybe taking a lesser powerful priest, so this is a three, 
And now at the end of a round, majority is going to rule in the priest track. So whomever has the most up here, it's going to be very important. And the tie break is always who is closer to the end. Now the white god card I mentioned before allows you to play any die and act as if you played a six. So if I played the white god card and of course I paid my offering and instead of placing that three I placed a one, I still get to take a six value action rather than whatever the die says. And when you play a priest of the same value as someone else, you actually bump them down a spot. So I would become the tie-breaking priest and he would move down. And I still take my fire bonus just like any other priest time. Uh, next on the list, we have our movement action. Now, oh, where's, let's get the right side so we can show you both of these. So this is your water and or land movement. Now let's take you to the islands. In between each space on the island is a marked value for water travel as well as for land travel. So a four diet allows you to move from this forest to this uh, reddish beachy for or I don't know desert. Uh, yeah, all in caps. Um, and a five over the water allows you to get to this beach. So having a dice placed here will also matter whatever is surrounding your huts on the board. You initially place a couple of huts out next to one value fish. If the black player were to play a five onto the land or sea uh, migration, that allows them to choose one of the adjacent things to one of their huts and migrate. So let's say the black player was going to move into this sand space. You move the, the first available hut from your player board and you'll place it into the area that's appropriate. Now the first thing you do is gain a resource whatever land you've entered. So this one pays out in sand and this adds into your player board here. So a sand would go here and we previously earned a wood and uh, offering token from our startup resources. And it's kind of important to choose these spots wisely. You're going to be covering them up with buildings and having them cut off other areas. You would never want to cut off a corner or anything because your biggest points are going to come from covering up each and every space in this area. So it's important to try and choose things that are going to have the most options later. And if you can't see what I mean now, it's just going to come during the game. But having something like this is a better fit than having something out in the middle that's mucking up many different rows and lines. So if you would like, when you migrate into a new area, you can play a red god and a harvest token as normal and you can get victory points equal to the value of fish there immediately. So the fish in the new space I landed in was a four. So I may play a red god and just net four quick victory points because the only other way you're gonna get those victory points is if you still rule an area at the end of the game and that's the last person to arrive at an area goes into that building and whoever's in the building at the end of the game gets points there is no reason to assume you'll still be there at the end of the game if it's your first or second migration. So the Red God is actually pretty worth it at four, five, or six points, I say, most of the time. Next on this list, you have man-woman tiles. So when you're playing that smaller game, you have the either man or woman tile, but with the more people, you'll have them broken out. And let's say green would like to select a man tile for their board. Then you'll look at the board and there'll be a selection of six men and women tiles. Maybe someone got the man tile earlier because I moved it away. So you will have your choice of the value of die you placed or anything lower than that. So they go in order from one to six. So you could have a man that gives you a building. You could have a man that gives you a tattoo. So player turn order, man that gives you just straight up two victory points. Uh, more buildings and more buildings 
And having multiples of the same man or woman is actually not a bad thing. You can multiply their, their use later in another phase. So it's not a bad idea to have the same things. Let's say maybe I've got a task or something that asks me to get this man that gives me victory points and I add him to my player board. Those are pretty straightforward. If you play another die there, you'll grab a different man or a woman if you'd like. Now we've come to the more intricate two choices. So we have a kind of catch-all of buying resources for pips. So a six here is going to give you the most options, but less is not necessarily worse. And now what you can do with a die on this little hand is written on your player board, as is everything in this game, I apologize. So, for one pip to one, or two pips for one, you can do lots of different things. So the most straightforward is the two for one. You can move a hut down to the last possible square to get out of your way. You can buy a harvest token. You can buy wood, sand, or rock, whatever you like. You can take an available god card, either one of the three that is face up or one off the top of the deck. Um, one for one, you can either buy victory points or you can do something really interesting with your men and women that you've purchased. So once per game, each man or woman tile can be pushed down for their value in tattoos or shells. So this man is worth, pardon me, this man is worth four tattoos. Uh, we have ladies over here that are worth shells, anywhere from, I think it's one to four, but I think maybe two to four. Uh, so a number of shells. And once they're pushed down, they're pushed down for the rest of the game. You just use them once. The shells are used to purchase jewelry at the end of the round. And tattoos, as I said before, are used for player turn order. So for one point off of the pips of the dice you have, you can push down one tile. So you could do that with multiple pips. If I played a six, I've got six points to play around with. So I could place, I could push down two tiles and buy two offering tokens, whatever I like with those number of pips. But this space is great and variable and lovely, and I think you can't use it enough. Now... We come to buildings, and buildings certainly sometimes feel like an end of the game thing, but they're worth a lot more points if you do them early on. So the way a building works, let's say the black player has placed a six on the building space. We come to their board, and we see they have a number of buildings along the bottom. So these are ranged from one to six. Uh, by placing the six, I could place a six or below so I could place any of these but because I don't want to have to get a six on there again I'm gonna choose that one and what I do is I take find two resources that are next to each other on my board and I spend them to build a building now the buildings don't have any presence on the islands but if you flip this up you'll see that it nets us a number of victory points and a fire bonus. So that's the same fire bonus as when you do the priest track. So that is where you can have either a god card or an offering and a tattoo or a shell. Maybe get that last shell you need for a piece of jewelry that's coming up and you know you're doing pretty well in the turn order. Uh, all these things coming up. But what did I say about victory points? Oh yeah, those are written on the board. So in the first rounds Priests will be worth fewer points, and they get stronger as you go, so each row of jewelry is a round in the game. And for the first two rounds, building a building is worth 10 victory points. As you can see, by the end of the game, it's only worth 4. So that's what all these pictures mean in the middle here. So, yes, it is hard to build buildings at the beginning, but they're going to give you 10 victory points each, and a small bonus if you can build all six of them by the end of the game. Now we'll get into the second phase of the game. Second phase! We are done placing our dice and taking our actions, and what's next? Let's all activate our men and women! Yay! So, in this phase, in turn order, each player is going to activate one man and one woman and take whatever it is on their card that they do. 
So we have a man here that gives you resources. We have a man here that builds buildings. We have a woman here that pushes huts down, makes room for more men and women. And we have a man here that also builds buildings. So the way this works is each player goes through and assigns one of their men and one of their women to do a thing. If you have two men or two women that have the same ability, so these two men that build buildings, you can use them to double the effect. You can't take the same action twice, but you'll do a, a, an effect twice as good. So two men that give you a resource give you two resources. Two men that build a three-level building will give you a six-level building. So let's say we activated the men, then we come down here and we can take our six and build our building and that skips having to do that during the regular action phase. This also nets us the regular victory points and fire bonus so we get a bunch of lovely stuff and that just meant that we had two men that were designed to do the same thing. Uh, for the woman, we only have one. She gives us a hut that's moved down to the last possible square. Now this is where that last god card comes, or not the last god card, I'm sorry, the green god card. So green god allows you to, again, pay the harvest token and double your effect of any one man or woman card. So if I wanted to push two huts out of the way, I would use the green card and take them and move them down to the last available spot. I have now cleared my way to have two more men and women next round without having built any huts. Yes, I do want to get huts onto the islands, but sometimes the dice don't line up for that. This is where we come in and we determine turn order, we get priest track, we get jewelry, we get tasks. And this is a lot of information, and it's really important. This is where you get most of your victory points in the game that aren't decided at the end. So first things first, we talk about the tattoo track. So earlier in the game, if you had any gentlemen that scooched down for you during the action phase, they paid you in tattoos. So when you gain these tattoos, they move on this track up here. The blue player, or the black player would have moved up three spaces on this track and the green player did not get any tattoos this round. So let's say this is our final standing. During phase three in the tattoo round, this determines the player order. Black has become the first player and green has become the second. Now if green had later gained three tattoos and is on top of black at the end, green would be the first player. Whomever is higher on the stack is the tiebreaker. Whomever got there last. This is a Stefan Feld game. This is his thing. We just go with it. So black is first and green is second. These players will also net victory points equal to wherever they are in that track. So you can see the first two spaces are worth one, after that it's worth two, and four, and six, and all the way up to 15. We take those victory points and everyone moves back to the front of the stack. So each round the tattoo track is reset. Next, we have a new player order and in doing that we start on the next phase. The priest track. Now we see which priests were built each priest this first round will give you one victory point and whomever has the most priests here or the tie-breaking priest here will gain themselves a god tile. Now these god tiles are friggin awesome. You cannot underestimate the power of these. You start the game with two and each one of these god tiles allows you to play them as any god you wish without having to pay a harvest token. God tiles allow you the freedom to enhance any effect you want for freezies and they're amazing. And the priests don't actually move after this. They stay here from round to round. So the priest track is incredibly powerful. You must compete with people here. It is too important not to. Uh, after we've done the priest track, each player in the new turn order has the opportunity to buy one piece of jewelry. The jewelry ranges from one to five shells and from I think it's one to nine victory points and also will be important in the next phase. So if I did have five shells after the first round I could buy this piece of jewelry and 
There's also an in-game victory point condition for having six pieces of jewelry, very important. Now, everybody chooses whether or not to buy that jewelry. The rest will fall away. You only get one shot at it, and that keeps the rounds counted. So we're in the first round, so you can tell because now the jewelry is gone. And the last part of this is probably the trickiest part of this whole game. So let's talk a little bit about tasks. We come down here and we look at the bottom of the player board. So this is the black player's player board. They have three undone tasks and kind of a completed task pile. Each round you're going to have the opportunity to gain six victory points by completing a task. Most of the time it doesn't actually have you discard anything, it's just a, a check of whether or not you've completed whatever it's asking. This one is asking for two of the red god cards in hand. This one wanted two of the man or woman tiles that give you a man tile three or less. We didn't actually see any of those. And this one was our simple beginning of the game light green one that asked for a man and a woman tile completed. Now, as you could see, we had this one. So we could claim this, take our six victory points, and put it in our completed pile. Before the task taking time, you have the final god. This is the yellow god. Uh, he allows you to complete a task minus one of its components for negative two victory points. So instead of getting six, you get four victory points, but you get to complete the task, and it counts toward end game scoring. So this one that asks you have two of the same uh, male or female cards, you only need one of them. Uh, the let's see, having uh, four huts uh, down at the bottom, you only need three of them. Uh, two of the guys that draw you cards, you only need one. So it can be a huge moon if you really just didn't get to that last little bit of a task. You can still qualify for the end of the game because there are huge victory points to begin gained by tasks. The next thing you'll do in player turn order is you'll choose a new task and we will have six different tasks each round. So anything that's not chosen will be tossed away. And these range from having huts on a specific type of uh, land, to having numbers of tiles pushed down, men and women, to specific man-woman tiles, to having four men tiles, there's, there's a little bit of everything. Some of these tasks are hard. One of them asks you to have a hut on each of the five islands, that's pretty crazy. Some of them ask you for simple things, as you see, like men tiles, nothing too crazy or out of the box. Um, sometimes they'll even ask you to have three huts next to a specific kind of fish. There are four kinds of fish here. Um, that is a big chunk of why I like this game and why I feel like maybe drafting these tasks before the game starts is a better way to start it out than just to be dealt them. You're an island people, I guess, and you're dealing with monsoons and things, so I guess you just live your life. But it does feel like it takes a lot away from the game if you can't get to that last task you wanted. Uh, next we'll go through the conclusion and then we'll wrap it up. Alright, so what did we think of the game? Bora Bora is easily one of the prettiest, best Euros I've played all year. It is meticulously designed, all the way down to the interactions of the different phases, how the gods work together, how different bonuses can be accomplished and enhance one another. Uh, it does have some fiddliness. You're moving a lot of pieces around, a lot of things are going from one space to another, and each round the upkeep is a little much. It reminds me a lot of Trajan in that way because each every year you kind of clear out a thing and put out some stuff, and you're doing that every round in this game, but it works. It works perfectly. Uh, the components are beautiful. Uh, there's a lot of wood, there's a lot of little huts, and the dice are fine. I sometimes wish people would get fancier with dice, but okay, whatever. I'll probably just replace them with different D6s. Uh, the cardboard is not bothersome. The little shells and things, you'd think these would bug the crap out of me, but they don't. They're fine. And the priests are the one thing in this game that's a little, like, uh, it's just a weird little pawn. 
I don't quite understand that, but you get what you get. Uh, the, the few things I would have to point out, you have uh, different colored fish tiles. Uh, they're both colored and they're different kinds of fish, but you'd think that they could have just made those different resources. Make one an octopus, one a fish, one a seahorse, or I don't know, maybe something more appropriate to a Bora Bora Islands, but I don't think four different styles of fish was easy to spot. And in such a large game that takes over such a big table, it's hard to pay attention to such a little itty bitty detail. So now I'm just nitpicking because the game is so good. It rewards players choosing a st strategy and accomplishing that strategy with kind of whatever comes along similarly to it. It still reminds me a lot of Trajan in this way. I think if you called Trajan, you know, Haiti and instead of the Roman Empire, then you just have an island, they'd be very similar games with a very different mechanic. The dice placement in this game is amazing. Uh, having to choose to place your most powerful effects first so that you don't get cornered out later is really nice unless you have a god card that overrides it and see all these things just keep piling together which makes it hard to teach. This video took me many takes to make it cohesive and I apologize if it's not. <laughs> it's hard to fit it all in because each phase and each action you take interacts with other things in the game and that can make teaching a little more tricky. Uh, the rulebook is not terrible so even just handing someone the rulebook to get a better idea of what they're in for is not a bad idea but of course I'm gonna provide you a video and try and help you through that. Uh, gameplay rewards strong uh, in-game finishers. If you're good at making an overarching strategy and kind of coming to a conclusion, this is going to be good for that. Uh, anything else that just... No, it's just beautifully done. It is not my game of the year, but it's certainly in my top 10, which should be coming soon. I should probably make a video. Uh, <laughs> But that's all for now, and I hope you guys liked what you saw, and if you do, please comment, like it, go see my website, it's maggiebot.com, and I'll see you all later.